The campaign of violence against the Syrian people continues. Chef. Mike Emanuel in Washington this afternoon. Mike, thanks very much. Let's take this to the judge. Uh, Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, is with us at the table. Uh, judge, what's, the, what's your read on this use of executive order for, for, a, for a matter like this? Well, my read is that it is lawful because the Congress authorized the Secretary of the Treasury and the Secretary of uh, State to put anybody they want on a terrorist watch list and deprive that person of, of ordinary use of communications, but it's highly unconstitutional and it's two-faced. The government of the United States of America regularly, consistently, systematically, and every hour of the day follows people, listens to what they do, monitors their movements, monitors their phone calls, monitors their email, and according to the director of the CIA, anticipates their behavior. So what the president is attempting to punish Syria and Iran for doing, intelligence agencies in the United States of America do as well. Do you remember the incident when the Occupy Wall Street group tried to shut down BART, the Bay Area Rapid Transit in San Francisco? What did the city of San Francisco do? Shut down the internet? and shut down cell phones for those people. The very same thing the president wants to punish people who, when they do it in Syria and Iran. You've said your first reaction was, and I quote, physician heal thyself. Yeah, my first reaction when I saw this was, is the president serious? He wants to punish people for doing the very same thing that his own government does at his own direction and by his own leave? And the answer is yes, because he's running for re-election. And Syria and Iran, even though they are run by monsters, are immensely unpopular. And attacking them verbally or even legally is a popular thing for politicians to do. There's a Clinton-era statute, though, that you point out that's expanded in the George W. Bush years yes. that makes some, makes some of this possible. Yes, that statute lets the Secretary of the Treasury or State designate any person they want to be put on the terror watch list. And once you're on that list, the federal prosecutors can go after any assets that you have here, and it can go after your liberty, which of course would keep you from coming here. It could certainly interfere with your ability to communicate. So what the president has basically done is he has put the head of the Iranian government and anybody who works with him, and the head of the Syrian government and anybody who works with him on the terror watch list, hmm. which lets federal prosecutors in the United States seize any assets that they have. It also prevents businesses from sending software to these people that they might use in Syria or Iran to block communications via the internet. So you can do it, but it's a bad idea. He can do it to the people in Iran and Syria, but what he's punishing them for, his own government is doing as we speak. Judge Napolitano, thank you. You're welcome. The shooting of Trayvon Martin, the Central Florida teenager now, and the big news this hour, the police chief who temporarily stepped aside last month over his department's handling of that shooting is resigning effective tonight. And the question is, will a potential Florida jury use this information as evidence? Back to the legal experts now. Randy Zellin is joining us now, criminal defense attorney and Fox News senior judicial analyst. Judge Andrew Napolitano is back as well. Randy, how would you use such a thing? Well, it's, I, I don't know. I, I've always thought from the beginning that this case was problematic from an evidentiary standpoint. Putting aside race, putting aside George Zimmerman, the defendant, the initial pursuit. To me, there was a second thing that went on. And right now, even we just saw, they don't know who the aggressor was. Therefore, I think the police chief actually acted rather diligently, reasonably, in really not knowing what to do. We don't know what input he got from the prosecution. And I think at some level he's being made to be a fall guy. Look, obviously mistakes were made from the very beginning. Obviously, with hindsight, which is perfect, which is 2020, he should have been charged at the time. He should have been restrained for some reason and some charge filed against him. But we now know that the prosecutors know a lot more than what the police knew at the time. But it is a very, very unusual case in which A shoots B with a gun, and A is permitted just to leave because of what A says at the scene. The police would want more information and would want to do more of an investigation before they decide, okay, you can go home. This idea that, that uh, we're on track now seems to make sense to most parties. There may have been mistakes in the very beginning, but now, now the process is working. But rallying for the man, I, I, I find it interesting at least, given that this is a man who left his house with his weapon to pursue someone who he'd seen do nothing, and then he shot him and killed him. You make first I don't know what happened in the middle there. And that's, that's exactly the point. Of course, if he'd stayed Nobody in his knows. house. 
But unfortunately, the quirk in this law is that George Zimmerman, the defendant, could have been the initial aggressor. But at that point, if he does nothing more, and suddenly Trayvon Martin becomes the aggressor, and George Zimmerman reasonably believes that his life in, is in danger, according to the Stand Your Ground law, he's got the right to use deadly force, which he used. Yeah, it's an NRA law, and the NRA's even backing off that law a little bit, isn't it? Well, the, the problem with the law is, as Randy pointed it out, that you can actually commence this whole thing yourself. You can become the initial aggressor which is what the government is going to say Zimmerman was, and it's going to depend on what the evidence shows, and still claim the protection of the law. Most statutes that permit self-defense, permit you to use force or violence to defend yourself, do not permit you to do so when you started the whole thing. This statute, untested until now, does permit you to use force and violence even if you started the whole conflict. Is the word reasonable in there anywhere? Reasonable yes. Reasonable force? Yes. I don't know if the word reasonable is, reasonable in, the, belief. is in the statute. Right, right. But, but your, your belief that the other person is about to inflict deadly force on you must be a reasonable belief. So in order for the jury to take this defense into account at the time of his trial, Mr. Zimmerman must present them a basis upon which they can come to the same conclusion that he did. If he fails to present that basis, the court won't let the testimony go in. I'm out of time. Gentlemen, thank you. We'll be back. Welcome back. Congress can't agree on a long-term budget plan, but they have agreed on one thing. It should be illegal to protest near the president or the Secret Service. Is that an assault on free speech? Let's talk to Fox senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. Good morning to you, Judge. Good morning, Judge. Stevie. The answer to the question is yes, it is an assault on free speech. You have the right to make your opinions known in such a way that you're not blocking traffic and you're not blocking right. uh, pedestrians or the president's car goes by. You could say, hey, Mr. President, we love you. We hope you get reelected or start packing. Sure. You know, everybody wants to make sure that our president is safe. But the Secret Service not only providing security in this instance, but essentially you're saying they're checking the content of signs and whatnot. This is a very dangerous piece of legislation. There were no committee hearings on it. There was no debate on it. And the president signed it in secret. It was passed unanimously by the Senate, and only three members of the House of Representatives vote against it. It basically lets the Secret Service decide who gets near whoever they're protecting, not just the president. Right. It could be Hillary Clinton. It could be the vice president. It could Romney, be Mrs. Newt. Mrs. Obama. Exactly. And the Secret Service can make that decision on the basis of the content of your speech. So if you have signs that say, start packing, Mr. President, the Secret Service can whisk you away. If you have signs that say, we love you, Mr. President, the Secret Service will let you stay or has the authority to let sure. you stay. That is using governmental power to discriminate on the basis of your opinions, the content of your speech. That's what the First Amendment was written to prevent the government from doing. Well, even though most Americans haven't heard about this, so you got to look at some of the penalties. If you are charged, fine and prison term up to one year or up to 10 years if firearm is used or serious injury is caused as well. What are, what are they trying to do here? I think they're trying to insulate people in the government from the opinions of the rest of us. Remember, this statute... They're building a wall. Right. This statute doesn't say there's a bubble around the president. This statute says there's a bubble wherever the Secret Service wants the bubble. Right. It's letting the Secret Service, we know that some of them are great and some of them are not so great, deciding where we can stand when we protest. That is a profound violation of the First Amendment. The government doesn't seem to care about our civil liberties anymore, and the American public need to know that. Fox received emails from a family in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The president's motorcade was coming down our street. We were standing in our front yard with our infant children. The Secret Service made us get out of our front yard and go into our house because they didn't want the president to see us. Oh my God. That's goodness. not America. That is unusual. All right. Well, I'm sure they had a good reason, right? They didn't give one. Okay. And they shouldn't Get have that authority. It. You should be able to stand on your own property. Just to wave. I mean, that's Absolutely. historic. The president doesn't drive by every day. Right. Unless you live at 1700 Pennsylvania. Steve, we're watching these things. You are. All right. Uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano, we thank you very much. Pleasure. The chase is over the stolen police car up against the tree. We'll keep you updated.
I'm watching the judge's reaction to that story, John, as you, as you tell it. Just kind of shaking your head in disapproval, Judge. I'm just sort of putting my mind back in the old days. Somebody old running days. out of my courthouse, and my courtroom, and stealing a police car. All right, the judge is actually here for an unrelated story that I will go on now. The Supreme Court is set to hear arguments tomorrow on the Arizona's uh, controversial immigration law. That requires police to check the immigration status of anyone they suspect is in the country illegally if that person is stopped for any reason. Now, the court must decide if the state law oversteps federal power or if a state can enforce its own version of immigration policy. Uh, Judge Napolitano is here, Fox News senior judicial analyst. And there's a little asterisk with that part of the state's case, Judge, because the state is arguing they want to enforce their own version of immigration policy because they believe the federal government is not doing its job. Yes. How important is that yes. asterisk yes. to this case? Well, the court has never reviewed that, and this is really the heart of uh, Arizona's argument, and this is Arizona's conundrum. The conundrum is you, the federal government, are forcing us to make entitlements available to people who are here illegally. The federal government makes us spend this money, and the Supreme Court says that the federal government has the authority to make us spend this money. Health, safety, welfare, morality, and education. Arizona has to spend that money on people lawfully in Arizona and unlawfully in Arizona. Therefore, you, federal government, should enforce the border. You should enforce the federal law so that illegals aren't here. And if you won't do it, we'll do it for do you. They have a point. That, in a nutshell, is Arizona's argument. Well, they have, a, they have a political point. I think it is true that the federal government is not enforcing the statute. But not a legal point. Well, that's where the Supreme Court is going to get involved. Because in order for Arizona to enforce its own version of an immigration law, it will be taking some jurisdiction away from, stepping in the place of, the federal government. How do we know that? Because the Supreme Court has consistently ruled that regulation of immigration is part of America's foreign policy. And that's why the states delegated this authority away to the federal government so that America could speak with one voice on immigration and foreign policy. I only have a minute here, but let's say the Supreme Court rules in favor of the federal government and follows what you're saying has been the past precedent. Right. Can the Supreme Court send a message in some way to the federal government, even if they rule on the federal government's behalf, to tighten up immigration policy or issue a new mandate when it comes to immigration based on Arizona's argument? Uh, two, two points. The Supreme Court is unlikely to tell the federal government, what, tell the executive branch what laws to enforce and what laws not to enforce. The second is the relationship between this executive branch and this Supreme Court, one is unlikely to pay much attention to the other. So watch the ruling. Watch the ruling. And watch the wording. There you go. Judge Napolitano. Nicely put, Counselor. Thank you very much. I'm learning <laughs> each and every day with you on set. Judge, thank Pleasure. you. Well, the former BP worker now faces the first criminal charges from one of the worst environmental disasters in modern history, the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico two years ago. You'll recall the explosion at the offshore rig killed 11 people, injured more than a dozen others, and unleashed some 200 million gallons of oil into the Gulf. Is it all cleaned up and ready like the commercials say? No. Absolutely, emphatically, it is a fact that it is not all fixed. It forced the feds to temporarily close thousands of square miles of the Gulf of Mexico, severely hurting the fishing industry, the backbone of local economies. Cops arrested that former BP engineer at long last today. Investigators say he deleted more than 200 vital text messages from his iPhone, which they say revealed that he was aware that top kill method to stop the oil spill was failing. Prosecutors claim the worker got rid of those texts after he learned he was under investigation. If the court convicts him as charged, he faces up to 20 years in prison. Let's take it to the judge. Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, was here. What do you make of this? Sure. You know, it's a little unusual because the allegations, which right now consist of just a one paragraph complaint against him and a five page affidavit by the senior FBI agent investigating him, uh, uh, state that the destruction of these text messages and emails occurred after the well was capped and that he only destroyed his own copies. He didn't seek to retrieve copies of what he had sent or to get copies of what had been sent to him. And it seems as though he was caught in a sting. Again, the affidavit's a little ambiguous, but it seems as though the FBI sent people to him asking him for copies of his records, and it revealed that he had destroyed them. 
But what it does reveal is a good thing about BP, and we didn't know this before. Mm. BP's general counsel sent a legal hold notice to every employee of BP. That's a formal instruction that you are to retain every document in your file, hard and electronic, until we tell you you don't have to keep hold of it. We and do that here all the time. We, Every company does that. That's abso standard. Absolutely. And, and people know this. They know that they have to retain it. He defied those five legal hold notices and destroyed these 200 documents. Now, did anybody suffer as a result of this? That remains to be seen. But the, the, the allegations against him are pretty crisp and pretty direct. And the government uh, experts were able to reconstruct the text messages and emails he thought he had destroyed. All right, we'll find out about those text messages, but a bit quickly, if you will indulge me, uh, uh, a matter of, I don't know, from the irony file. Judge, we were talking about this just a moment ago. The feds are now investigating whether someone from the Saints organization was electronically eavesdropping on the opposing team's dressing room, and to that you point out the irony that the greatest eavesdropper in the country is the federal government. We're talking about illegal eavesdropping. We're not talking about wa search warrants from judges. We're talking about federal agents doing this on their own and not getting search warrants. The federal agents do this at every moment of every day, 365 days a year, right? Yes, they do. The same federal government that's now investigating some former official of the Saints. And yet, nothing. Nothing. Ever. Irony, as Shepard Smith would say. Mm. Dripping. Judge, thank you. <laughs> Pleasure, Chef. It is happening right now. There are new developments this morning now in the fight over Arizona's immigration law, which will have huge implications for everyone across the country. Uh, opening statements have begun at the uh, Supreme Court hearing on SB 1070, and Judge Anna Napolitano, our Fox News senior judicial analyst, is with me here in studio. Good morning to you. Good morning, Bill. Arizona will come in and argue what in support of this? Here's law. Arizona's argument in a nutshell. The federal government forces Arizona to spend money on uh, health, safety, welfare, morality, and education on everybody in Arizona, whether they're lawfully or not. So the least the federal government can do is enforce the border laws and keep illegals out. That's Arizona's okay, now position. The, the, and if the federal government yeah. won't do that, then Arizona will do it for them. Okay, what's the argument on behalf of the government? This is our job? The federal government's job, is, the federal government's argument is immigration and border control is a federal issue, and we can't have states doing it on their own. Otherwise, we will have 50 separate foreign policies rather than one. And when the Constitution was created, the states delegated away their ability to regulate foreign matters and immigration matters to the federal government. P.S. This is the way the Supreme Court has ruled whenever they've confronted the okay, issue. Now, to a lot of our viewers are focused on Arizona because it's been in the news so much, Correct. but there are other states that are, have similar laws. Alabama, Georgia, Indiana, South Carolina, Utah. Some of these have been challenged. Some have been upheld. Only Arizona's is before the Supreme Court today because the others have not yet made their way to Arizona. And there's a bizarre twist here. The bizarre twist is that only eight of the justices will hear this because Justice Kagan has taken herself off the case because she says she uh, worked with the Justice Department in resisting Arizona's statute when she was in the Obama administration. Question, what happens if there's a tie, if it's four, four to four? four? The answer is that he, the decision below is upheld, and the decision below is Arizona's law is unconstitutional. But it is only unconstitutional in that portion of the country where the courts below have jurisdiction, which is the Ninth Circuit, which is the western end of the country, plus uh, Alaska and Hawaii. Well, okay, all right. Before we get to that point, though, this is basically an argument over states' rights, is it not? It's an argument over states' rights and whether the states can supplant the federal government when it can't or won't enforce the laws. And that is critical, right? Because yes, if it's you're critical. arguing that the federal government's not enforcing laws on its books, then what do you do as a state? Well, Look, here's what the Supreme Court will say. It is not our job to tell the president how aggressively to enforce the laws. The president decides what resources to be distributed, and if you don't like the way the president enforces the laws, elect a new president. That's from the court's point of view. From Arizona's point of view, they're in a real conundrum because the same Supreme Court before which they're arguing as you and I speak has told them, you must provide all these services, right. health, right. welfare, safety, right. morality, education, to illegals. So Arizona's caught in a box. We can't both pay for the illegals and let them flood over our borders. Quickly on this issue, Dick Durbin, the senator from Illinois, made this point just yesterday. Roll this and I'll ask you specifically about two words he focuses on. 
We do not help them in their job when we create laws like this, which puts them in a position of calling people out because of their status, not because of the suspicion they've even uh, committed a crime. What strikes me, status and suspicion, is that going to be argued here? Yes. One of the weaknesses from the point of view of a judge of the Arizona statute is it permits stopping on the basis of suspicion and arresting on the basis of status, appearance, mm -hmm. lawful here or not lawful here. Right. Really. It gives too much discretion to police. That's going to be argued. If, if, if you can get over the issue of is this a federal issue or a state issue, then they're going to get into the issue of how much discretion does this give mm -hmm. to the police and does that discretion yeah. violate the Constitution? A, a ruling in June? Yes, a ruling in June, and probably same around the healthcare. same time as uh, health care. Buckle up, baby. I'll be ready. You, right. You'll be on the cot upstairs because we're going to need you. Thank you, Judge. <laughs> We have committed money to rescuing one badger it's bank and financial issue and we've got to commit even more. We've got to commit even more. This economy is in rock. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. 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 I warned you. That's all I could do. I warned you. You know, I was never a fan of these bank bailouts, of any bailouts. I said it was a slippery slope. I said the tarp was a trap. And now, and now this. The inspector general overseeing that bailout fund saying, Taxpayers are still on the hook for 118 billion bailout bucks, and guess what? They may never see a penny of it back. We're going to hear more from her tonight at 6 p.m. on FBN. But first, to the judge who, like me, saw it all coming. The fact that two Italian Americans were on this before anyone <laughs> is purely from coincidental. New from New Jersey. Um, this was so obvious. It I mean, was. You know. It was. And, and Neil, we were in the minority. A lot of so called conservative oh, conservatives all over and, and so called free marketers like Jack right. Welch, like President George W. Bush, who said, I have to assault the free market in order to save it. They went along with this. And about six months ago, when the big banks paid their money back. They, 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 they bought their stock back from the feds. They were boasting. Oh, the Fed, the, Tim Geithner was boasting. We made money on it. This morning we learned, as you just pointed out, that the taxpayers will lose about $118 billion of the $700 And what billion do you think, Judge, in the way, and Ben Steinway, love, I mean, we got right. a little dis, uh, disagreement. I like you when you're mad. But, you know, you think about it. The argument then was and has since been, boy, the hell we'd be in if we didn't. You can't prove a negative. No, you, of course you can't prove a negative. But now we have hundreds of small and mid-level banks that have federal dollars in there that can't pay the money back. What does that mean? That means they're on life support. That means they're only there because the government force-fed them cash. That means they shouldn't be there. They should collapse like Lehman Brothers did. And people like Barclays, will come, who bought the good parts of Lehman Brothers, will come by and, and purchase what is salvageable from these banks and make it profitable. And the rest will go away. That's the natural order of things. But when the government artificially puts cash in there and the taxpayers on the, are on the hook, that's $118 billion that could have been in the hands of entrepreneurs that will not be there. So when you hear the argument, this was money just created out of thin air. I mean, they just printed this money. Right. It wasn't sitting in a vault somewhere. It was just printed. Right. So their argument is the judge is wrong. This wasn't existing money. We made it. Well, when they make that money, they, of course, devalue everything that all of us exactly. own. Exactly. Except for the banks through whom the money is initially funneled, because the devaluation takes some time without getting without getting too right. technical. This is the greatest and clearest and most obvious cause of a price inflation in history when the government prints cash out of thin air, and they did this to us. All right, great job, buddy. Judge Napolitano is all over it Pleasure. again. I want to remind you folks who key, see these debates a lot. This is not a, a red or blue issue for me. Um, it's not a Republican or Democrat issue. As you know from this debate about the bailouts, it was happening during the Bush administration. I have a great deal of respect for, for President Bush. I mean, I just strongly disagreed with him on this state, on air as such. A lot of people in the White House back then did, didn't like us after that and all. But my, my issue on this is it's green. It's about your money. Not red or blue, you're green. We follow it. We are nerds on steroids. We just chase this stuff. So no matter the president wasting the money, um, or the amount of the administration under which it's happening, we're going to call them on it. Okay, so that's what being a business superhero is all about. Superhero Cavuto. I'm trying to <laughs> trying to get that thing going, and it's not really. Well, at least you understand where. No, you're not buying it, are you? The movies now.
We're hearing some theaters have hired a company to install tiny surveillance camera cameras, which would keep an eye on everybody. The company behind the cameras reports this could help crack down on folks who illegally record movies from their seats, but we're told theaters could use those cameras to look out for somewhat smaller crimes like texting during the movie. Let's take it to the judge. Our senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, I, I didn't know texting was illegal during the movie. I've been breaking the law. Gosh, I never heard that texting was illegal either, and I'm supposed to know all this stuff. Uh, Shep, it's a reflection of our attitude uh, about privacy. I mean, first it was cameras uh, at stoplights, and then cameras in street corners, and then cameras at ATM machines. Now it's cameras looking at you while you're watching the movie. If Americans don't care about privacy, this will just keep going, and we don't know where it will end. If Americans do care about privacy, they won't go into movie theaters where the owner of the theater watches you while you watch the movie you've paid to watch. You, you wonder what it's going to take to make people care about this. I mean, there will have to be some sort of event at some point to make people wake up and go, holy cannoli. Well, look. People uh, view a darkened movie theater as not a license to do that which is illegal, but as a, a place of general privacy. You're frequently with someone that you are close to. You're not accustomed to being watched at that time. Somebody will be watched at a perfectly innocent but normal set of behavior. The government will get their hands on it. It'll be the tip of an iceberg, and maybe then people will wake up. Either we want privacy or we don't. If we want privacy, we have to stop this. Now, Shep, it is not illegal. This is not the government doing it. This is private property. We have the freedom not to go in these theaters as long as they tell us that the cameras are looking at us. Yeah, it, it, but they got to tell you. And in this case, they don't tell us, right? Well, we don't know yet. This has not actually come out yet. The technology exists. The financing is there. The, the threat to do it was issued yesterday, which is why we're talking about it today. One would think that the theaters, if they want to keep customers coming back, would say to them, because some people are stealing our product, we're going to watch all of you. If you don't like it, go elsewhere, but we want to give you a heads up that this is what we're doing. If they watch people and don't tell them, they're going to lose a lot more business. Yeah, I'll watch them at home, unless and until they install a camera there, and then, you know, it's getting a hold somewhere. Oh, don't even talk about that. I know. <laughs> Judge, stand by. Thank you. Nice to see you. Enjoy the D.C. Nice. somehow. Thank you. Hey, Rick Perry's bid for president yeah, didn't go too well, but the governor of Texas created a firestorm when he said this about Social Security in one of the debates. Listen. And it is a monstrous lie. It is a Ponzi scheme to tell our kids that are 25 or 30 years old today, you're paying into a program that's going to be there. Anybody that's for the status quo with Social Security today is involved with a monstrous lie to our kids. Well, the governor took a lot of heat from the left and the right. That was only six months ago. But just this week, a new report announced that the Social Security Trust Fund is expected to run out of money by 2033. Three years earlier than expected. So is Social Security truly a Ponzi scheme? Joining us right now, Fox News Judicial Analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. Judge, are you, are you surprised that the government came out and admitted this? Yes, Brian. Uh, I'm glad you asked that. I am surprised the governor came, government came out and admitted it. And I think the only reason it did is because Governor Perry, who was excoriated by the left and the right for making what we now believe was a truthful and accurate statement, started this ball rolling. Is there really a trust fund? Is your money actually being held for you by the government? The answer to both questions is no. The so-called trust fund is whatever is left in an account, a ledger sheet, as a result of paying out what has come in. And the government, for the first time in history, admits that that money, that that number will be a negative figure right. 21 years from now. So what does this mean? It means that FDR's promise that the government will hold your money for you not true. It means that your, uh, I, your concept of that's my money and the government has a legal obligation to pay it to me, not true. All it means is those are tax dollars and the government can spend them however it wants. Sure, and we've got a graphic over on the big wall that shows exactly what you're talking about. Uh, screen left, there's uh, FDR, goes to the taxpayer, up to the government, should hold it for you in what looks like a lockbox. There is no lockbox, but it spends it instead. You see the part where it says should hold it for you, but right. spends it instead? There are three Supreme Court cases addressing the constitutionality of Social Security, and all three of those cases say the government is not obliged 
obliged to hold it for you. The government is not obliged to pay it to you. They are just tax dollars, and the government can spend it however it wants. Now, this was in a surplus because there were less people retiring and more people working originally, right? Yes, now it's the other way around. Well, I, I don't know if the numbers are the other way around, but now more is going out than is coming in, and the remainder right. will be below zero in 21 years. People say in all the entitlements that this is the easiest one to fix. Well, it could be fixed by raising taxes. A, 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 a serious problem, changing the age at which uh, people receive it, or making it voluntary and letting people uh, opt Put some into private accounts. But Governor Perry was inappropriately excoriated for it and suffered terribly for saying it, and he was correct. The judge is not pro Ponzi, but he is <laughs> pro Fonzi. Yes, he is. <laughs> Bro, Fonzie. Happy days are here again. All right. Uh, All right Josh, thank, thank you, guys. You Have great weekends. That was great of the Fonz to raise Chachi, which was not his kid. It yeah, that's a whole other story. I wonder yeah. how things are going. Really? Uh, I'm is not Chachi sure. Italian? <laughs> I believe he is. <laughs> and then he fell in love with Joni, and they had a spinoff. Still ahead, though. <laughs> and the EPA. <laughs> You left me hanging there. I'm I was sorry. thinking Joni loves Chachi, yeah, whatever yeah, happened to her. Part. She I was the cunning ham girl. I regret Never mind. It. We digress. What does this have to do with Social Security? What, what does this have to do with the news? Nothing.